Now back to the show. This is The Law Show on CL 650. They say that breaking up is hard to do. That's a good uh, segue for the law show. We're talking about family law. We have David Halkett here from Macquarie Hunter and Sarah Morse uh, from Macquarie Hunter talking about breaking up is hard to do. Uh, at the end of the day, you ultimately have to divide what you've got. That's and uh, is that the most contentious part of a divorce? Take, take children out of it? Um, if you remove children, probably. Yeah. Um, although spousal support issues can be mm. very contentious as well. But um, the assets usually are should be easy to deal with, but there's always issues of whether or not something's been hidden, you know, uh, whether or not there should be an exclusion for certain property. So it, it can be contentious at times for All sure. All right, let's get into, Sarah, what is included? What is going to be divisible by 50%? And well, that's the way the government looks at it, right? They Like we, we said on a previous show, you know, if you were cheating on your spouse – you're not entitled to more because they're a bad person. It just, you're entitled to half. That's it, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah it, basically, anything, that, any assets that have accrued since the time that you got together, mm-hmm. so the time that you separate, is family property and divisible presumptively equally between the two parties. So there's yep. factors that can affect that, but it's anything crude. So it can be, um, you know, a, a valuable collection of something. It can be your your bank accounts, your stocks, any kind of investments, um, your family home, a recreational property, vehicles, any of those things, anything that would be identified as an asset can be divisible. That's okay, right. so what is excluded? Excluded is property you brought into the relationship. Um Subject to, of course, not putting it in joint names, which... Well, I think a lot of people aren't aware of this. Like, well, we'll give an example. Inheritance is included, yes. right? So say your grandma dies and she leaves you a half a million dollars. Well, aren't you lucky? Mm-hmm. But then you decide, well, we need, a, we, need, we need to buy a family home. So, well, there's half a million dollars sitting there. Let's buy a house together. Well, now you've taken what is somebody's uh, as a single individual and bring it into a joint situation. That's correct. What happens with that half a million dollars? Well, under the statute, that the five hundred thousand is supposed to remain yours, subject to you know if you're together a long time, the court saying that would be unfair. But we have law that says that you may lose your exclusion if you put it into joint names. You don't have an agreement because there's a presumptions of gifts between spouses. It goes back a long time. Now there's other case law that's come in since from a from a lower court that has said, well, that that case. The Court of Appeal case doesn't apply in this fact situation because it wasn't meant to be a gift. There was no transfer. But it's still not determined. So if you do put your exclusion at risk, if you put it in joint names, so say, as you said, I have something and Sarah and I are, are together. We have a house together. We put it in joint names, but it was my money. I may lose it if I put it in joint names. Now, can you write something up that says I'm putting this money in knowing that it was my grandma's inheritance? Can you do that? You can. And and you do that as a, a marriage agreement, uh, which can be done before or after marriage. And you simply say that this 500000 will remain mine afterwards. Now, now, does that hold up as years go by? It does. If, if both parties had independent legal advice and they knew what they were getting into. <clears throat> the tough part is when people are married, they don't even think of doing that because no one, when they're married, thinks they're going to be separated because no one gets married thinking I'm going to get divorced. Mm-hmm. So it could be a 20, say a 20 year relationship. And at the 12th year, you've gotten the $500,000. You buy a house together jointly, not thinking in eight years, you're going to be separated. And at the time, it's like, sounds like a great idea because almost everyone has their houses in joint names because banks like to spread the liability and oh, plus if, you, if anything were to happen to one of you no they, they, they it goes over to the exactly. spouse with no tax withheld or anything right yeah it, it just transfers in yeah no probate fees so <clears throat> you want to have it in joint names but you don't even think to do an agreement so, well, uh, we'll call them prenups that's what yep. people know them as are more people getting these prenups uh, I, I think it depends on their asset base. I mean, if there are assets to protect, I mean, I have had people come in and they they want to know about getting a, we call them cohabitation agreements, um, but they've really got no assets. So there's not much to protect. It may simply be for an inheritance and, or something that simple. Second marriages, I'm Second sure. Second marriages, yes. absolutely. I think the, the percentage would be 
huge on that. I, I'm finding that's the majority of my clients that are coming in for cohabitation agreements. It is a a, a second relationship. Yeah. And are they doing that to protect their children? Obviously, a lot from of the yeah. first, from the uh, first. A lot marriage. of time, they they want to make sure that they can leave what they brought in to, to their, their children. Um, now, one thing that a lot of people who live together may not have been married before in a lot of situations when they're younger, so they don't even know that they're entitled to this division afterwards. And um, it, so they don't get the agreements, but as Sarah said, the second ones tend to. If you've been gone through a divorce once, you know what you can get burned on, so to speak. Well, the other thing is, um, you know, you bring this up, well, you don't love me. Like, why, how could yes. you be asking me to sign this piece of paper? We're not even married yet. Don't you trust me? But on a second marriage, both parties, yeah. their feelings aren't hurt because they've been through it. Although it still comes up as one party is hurt over that being yeah. having brought up, you know, um, and how do you bring that up? Do you get, you don't get your lawyer to call, I hope. No, usually they've talked about it before. Like I've had clients come in and say that they, they might need a, a prenup or a cohab agreement for the, their new spouse. So I said, well, have you discussed it with the other spouse? And some, sometimes they have, they haven't. I said, well, before they get an agree, before I send an agreement to them that's drafted, you might want to talk to them first. Yeah, they're, they're, that's the communication you're talking exactly. about. Yeah. If you can't have that conversation, what success rate are you going to well, have? Well, exactly. And, and you know, it, it's something that you, as harsh as it sounds, if you think you need an agreement because you want to protect your assets and the new spouse does want to sign one, well, maybe that's a, a warning <laughs> sign that you shouldn't get together with that person. Right, right. But they don't see that. No, of course not. Love is blind. Mm -hmm. Is it? <laughs> it really is. Not it's... anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, not when you've not when you've practiced family law. Anyway. No, definitely not. <laughs> Can you see the signs, Sarah? Um, in what way? Can you see the signs that people are are headed down the divorce path? Ooh, socially. Mm -hmm. uh. Yeah, you know what? I think you can you can definitely see. Um, you, there, there's behaviors that you'll you'll see from people um, that sort of trigger thoughts yeah. that maybe they're they're not you know, you know happily married and, and things like that. You know, and do, pe <laughs> do people come to you on the QT Absolutely. and ask all the time? Absolutely, oh, yeah. they want oh, yeah. free advice. Yeah. Oh yeah, for oh, sure. Oh yeah. Well, what I find, I don't necessarily know because you're not in someone's home. You don't know if they're um, on the road to a divorce, but I can tell. When there's people I know, like on, I've told, I think we've discussed this before on my son's teams, I can pretty well tell if they're together or not. And someone, oh, how do you know it? You just know mm -hmm. <laughs> when, when you do our work, you can tell. But um, it's, it's hard to really know because some, every, every couple interacts differently. Mm -hmm. You know, that as I, I know someone once had said that they thought that the one, one of their children was going to get divorced and not the other one because the one that, they thought would be divorced was always like fighting with their husband and stuff, kind of like on Everyone Loves Raymond, you know, the, yeah, the, the yeah. grandparents. They battled, yeah. <laughs> and the other ones never did, but it was the ones who didn't who ultimately got divorced. The other two didn't. That was their way of communicating. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it, I think it depends on how, um, you know. We call them the Bickersons. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it just depends. Um, but I think Sarah and I probably can tell people who weren't to who aren't close anymore. Mm -hmm. You can see it. All right, here's a question for you. What's the biggest misconception, do you think, about your area of law? What do you think the biggest misconception is? Oh, biggest misconception. Or let you take the first one on that one. <laughs> um, that's a really, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. I mean... Okay, maybe about the biggest misconception about the lawyers that do this. Um. Oh, oh I mean, that's an easy one. I think... Um, you know that we're we're out to you know really, you know hurt the other person your financially. Your family or, records, right? Yeah, I, yeah, and well, I've been called that. Oh yeah, that that's that we're just trying to burn the other person, and and really, I think Dave and I are really focused on uh, you really trying to help the family come out on the other side better off where yeah. the, they've got a, a parenting plan that works for the parents that works for the kids um, that the assets are divided fairly that that both people can walk away feeling that you know they're in a, a better place it might not be you know, right away but eventually I mean we're, we're certainly you know we'll be tough when we have to be but we're certainly not trying to um, you know do any harm uh, to another person because if we're affecting someone else's financial position it's affecting 
potentially the kids. So and your job is to look after your client. It, yeah. it is, and to make sure that kids are protected. And I mean, we we work very collaboratively yep. for the most part with most of the other family law lawyers, and we're we're all you know pretty much uh, friends socially. And and I think that helps advocate for our clients because we're able to talk reasonably and rationally and come to a solution that's going to work. Yeah, I've I've no one's come to me and I've not wanted to get divorced. I've convinced them to get a divorce. Right. At the end. It yeah. doesn't happen. That's not so, your job. Exactly. So people have called, you know, they, they call us parasites and, you know, as you said, family wreckers. Those, I've had far worse terms called at me for that. It's like they came to me because their relationship wasn't working and sure. they wanted out. Right. We just, Sarah and I, our job is to help them get through Stick that. Stick handle it, right? Help mm-hmm. them get through a very difficult point in their life so that when they get through it, they can look back and say, it wasn't easy, but I got my way through it. Now it's the first day of the rest of my life. So I'll, I'll put the question to you. What's the biggest misconception do you think about family law? Um, I think the biggest misconception is that all we do is is fight between our cases all the time. We don't. As Sarah said, we collaborate. We resolve 95% of them. Um, I think the second one would be that we don't care what happens to the children. We do. We have to advocate for our clients, but our jobs are to make sure that they, the clients know they have to keep their children's best interest in play and in their mind at all time and that we don't want a solution that's not going to work for the family. We, so is that easiest to do when you have b- parties that are battling is say, listen, the real job is the kids yep. and the focus, our attention on yep. that. Yeah, exactly. And uh, deal with the children issues first. The money issues kind of flow from that. Uh, and I find that if people are happy with the resolution regarding the children, the rest of it, they're going to be relatively settled. They'll, they'll, they'll settle it pretty place. easily because yeah. the, the law is pretty clear as to what you're going to pay and how the assets are going to be divided. That's David Halkett. Sarah Morse also joins me from Macquarie Hunter talking about family law. We'll get into maybe some of the specifics about um, division of assets, like uh, if you have a strata title, if it's freehold land, like if there is any difference around those items. Next on CL650. There's more of the show still ahead. This is The Law Show on CL650.